So we have, I'm, I'm standing here beside myself in excitement today. Yeah. I am so excited for today, it's ridiculous. So today we have Brad Murray coming up to preach for us this morning. And it's, it's so awesome. It's so awesome. Pastor Gary talked two weeks ago about people stepping up. And I talked a little bit about it last week. It's so awesome that he's stepping up. And um, I'm going to cry, Brad. You haven't even started yet. <laughs> and it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And Brad, you're just, it's so awesome to see you guys stepping up. You and Jasmine is just fantastic. And uh, I'd like to pray for you before we get started here today, if that's okay. Father God, I just thank you so much for Brad, Lord. I just pray that you use him today, Lord, and just, uh, just anoint him, Lord, today. Give him a spirit of peace as he's up here on stage, Lord, and just make this a fiery word, Lord. Just, oh, Lord, touch the hearts of those in this audience, Lord, and the congregation here, and let us just chew on this word for the rest of the week. Lord, I just pray that you be with Brad and strengthen him, Lord, and just who, use him mightily as you see fit, Lord. I thank you so much for him. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. There you go. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's just pray before we start. I'm going to pray one more time. <laughs> Dear Lord, I just thank you so much for today. I thank you so much that we could come together and just um, just meet, just to worship you, just to learn about you, God. And right now, we just want to give my uh, my message, my sermon over to you, Holy Spirit, that only things you want to be said will be said. And I just pray that it will touch the lives of at least one person here today. So over the past little while, the mainly this past year, God has been teaching me and showing me so much about his love and about a, a father's love. And, and during this process, I have I've felt the Father's heart for the lost, for the broken, for the suffering and the hurting, um, like I've never felt it before, and just how much it hurts, how much it is broken and desperate for those people to come home. And I, I felt him saying over this past little while, as I prepared for this, just to teach his love, as it's been taught his Father's love has been taught through the eyes of religion for too long, where religion says God's love is God up here and us way down here. But it really is, God's love is God here and us here. Not that we're equal to God, but Jesus himself in John says, we become no longer servants, but we become friends of God. So today, my sermon is called A Father's Love, Religion versus Relationship. And a father's love <clears throat> is something that is so often misunderstood and misrepresented. And because of that, it, is, it keeps people from wanting to enter in and experience the full measure of God's love. And it keeps people in fear of God in an unhealthy way. They fear him unhealthily. And there's many reasons for that fact. And the many of that is because we live in a sinful and broken world. That so many people have had bad and negative experiences with their earthly fathers. Whether that be a biological father, stepfather, or just any father figure in their life. That because of that experience they've had, it skews or tarnishes the view of a father's love being something positive, life-bringing. You know, the love of our fathers on earth are supposed to be, in some way, a representation of God, our heavenly father's love for us. And when that view gets tarnished or skewed, it changes and keeps us from wanting to enter into God's love keeps us from thinking of a heavenly father's love as a good and life-bringing thing. That because of these experiences we have in the physical world, it keeps us from entering into God's love, and that we view it as harsh, judgmental, and something to be afraid of. It's fear-based. And my hope and prayer is today that we can show you how amazing and there's nothing to fear about the love of God. For me, I was blessed with an incredible earthly father that I would view him as a father that was far beyond above the standard for earthly fathers, that I hope that I can be just a small fraction of a father to my kids that he was to me. But it was interesting as he came out and visited us a couple months ago, we were talking and I was talking to him and he was saying that a lot of people viewed him as a harsh father to us, viewed him as strict, judgmental and just harsh to us. And even though we as kids, and it would never till this day, say that about him at all. And, you know, it got me thinking, why did they view his love completely different than what we experienced? You know, they, exp they thought it was harsh, and we thought it was, I mean, his love was completely sacrificial. He would give up anything for us. He would do anything for us. And even to this day, he would completely give anything for us.
And I mean, I know even today, they live an hour, 11 hours away. And if I were to call him tomorrow and say, I need help today, he would be on his way right now. And just why would those are two completely different views of the Father's love? And the answer, I believe, is relationship. That when we enter into relationship, it completely changes how we see, experience, and feel the love of a father. And I think people, we get this view of God, that there's love towards us, that looking from the in, outside in, they view it as, you know, super strict God with all these rules and regulations and stuff that we need to do. That love is something to be afraid of. And that a lot of that... I believe is traced back the way through love has been taught through the history of the church. And that because we view him as a strict God, it keeps us wanting to from fully enter into his love. And I want to start by looking at a well-known parable, well-known story in the Bible, and that's about the lost son or the prodigal son. And it's found in Luke 15, 12 to 24. And, you know, there's so much we can get from the story, but I just want to look at a small portion of it. And as I read it, I want you to think that the father represents God and the, son, the lost son represents us, humanity. And then there is the other son in there, but we're going to talk about him just a little bit later. The other one, sorry, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything there, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So that he got up and went to his father. But when he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And the first thing I want to point out that throughout this whole story, the son, the lost son, he was always a son of the father. That when he asked for the money before he left, when he took the money and left, when he was living wildly, and when he was feeding pigs, and even returned, he was always a son of the father. And that he was always a part of the family of the father, just not present in relationship with his father. And he himself, when he comes home, he says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father doesn't even address that issue. He doesn't even say anything about it. He just calls him, my son has returned. And I believe that this shows us that no matter where we are in our faith, no matter where we are in our walk, no matter what we're doing or what we believe, we are always part of the family of God. You know, if my son were to run away... No matter what he did, where he went, he would still be of my family lineage, of my family name, part of my family, just not at home in relationship. And I believe that our sonship or daughtership status, if that's a word, never changes. And that the only thing that changes in our relationship with God is our level of intimacy and our closeness to him. And see, I believe this is really important because people can feel unworthy or that they won't be accepted if they come to God or they won't be accepted if they try to come into the family of God. For, you know, for things they've done in the past or things they're doing or things they've said, done, or believed. Now, and this is something that the devil will push to say that you won't be accepted into Christ, you won't be accepted home because you've messed up too bad or too great. That you feel like you've slipped up and you won't get in. But see... Of course we will be accepted in. You were always a part of the family. We were never outside of the family of God, just outside of relationship, just outside of personal relationship with him. But always a son and always a daughter. 
that there's no application, there's no, it's entry for all. See, when we accept Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, and, or as if we turn back to him, you know, we, we say stuff like, you know, welcome to the family of God. But I truly believe it's more of a welcome home than a welcome to. Right. See, welcome to refers to as an outsider being let in, as somebody that's trying to get accepted that's different. Welcome home refers to somebody that was just coming home to where they belong. Jesus says he would leave the 99 sheep to find the one lost sheep. But to find the one lost sheep, it means it was once a part of the herd, herd of sheep. It's a welcome home, not a welcome to. We are all accepted into the family, not because of anything we do, but because through the cross, through Jesus, it's where we belong. The second thing is that the father saw the son coming from a long ways off. And he, tell him that he was, that tells us that he was watching, waiting, and hoping for if the son were to turn. Now, the father had no way of knowing if his son would return, if his son would come home. But he was watching and waiting. Why? Because he wanted to make sure that if the son decided to come home, the son knew that his father was always waiting wait for him to come, if he did. And that's exactly what God did for us. The whole point of sending Jesus to the cross, come to earth to die, defeat sin was to prepare a way for us to come home if we decide to come home. That, you know, Jesus came to earth, died on the cross way before any of us here today could ever make a decision to follow God or not to follow God. But the whole point of it was to make it ready for us in preparation for those that decide to come home. It's not to force us or pressure us to come home, but in case we decide to come home, his love is always pursuing and waiting for us to come. And we just need to stop and turn around. And when the father did see him coming, he did not wait for the son to come all the way home. He ran out to him. He sees him from a long ways off, and he runs to him. Now, if you think about the son coming home, he just came from a pig farm feeding uh, pigs in a field, you know, walking a long distance. And so he probably would have smelt pretty bad. He would have smelt like pigs, would have been dirty. He wasn't eating, he would have been weak, I picture having a hard time walking. And the father runs to him, embraces him, and I get this picture of just helping him home. And see, regardless of the smell or the state of the son, the father, overjoyed that he decided to come home, runs out to meet him and help him the way home. See, God does not expect us to come home in perfect condition, to come home smelling all clean, to come home having life all figured out. He's simply waiting for us to stop and toward, turn towards him, and he's running out to meet you, to meet us, and help us home. He will meet us where we are at. And it doesn't matter what state you are. You can't be too far gone, too dirty, or too unclean. He comes, and he makes us clean. He helps us walk the rest of the way home. He doesn't care what you know, metaphorical stink we have. He's just excited that we've decided to come home. He'll take care of our needs as the Father did. He fed him and clothed him. He brings us home and he takes care of our needs. We don't have to worry about that. He just needs us to make the choice to turn around. The Father never brings up the money the son took and that the son lost. He never says, you know, I told you so or you should have listened to me or anything like that. And just pure happiness. He throws a big party for the son, you know. You would think that the father would be resentful of the money wasted or that, but it's just pure happiness. And, you know, the Bible talks about hell, uh, heaven celebrating when someone lost comes home. Yeah. The joy of one returning completely erases the past that they had. See, I believe that God loves us the same no matter where we are in life or what we're doing. That is love for us the same if we're a pastor, preacher, missionary, or a drug addict or somebody that's completely outside of God. That his love never changes. The only thing that changes is relationship and intimacy. But his love never changes. And when we feel distant from God, it's not him backing away from us because we're doing something. It's us backing away from him. But his love is always there, always the same. And when we sin, we can get this idea that God is going to be mad, angry, or disappointed. And we can live in this fear of what happens when we sin and make mistakes, that God will abandon us or completely leave us. 
And, you know, I've thought this, and I'm sure most people have thought this too. Because of things I've done in the past, God is going to abandon me. God's not going to use me. I won't be able to do things for God or fulfill my calling on my life. But I want to look at another story in the Bible. And it's another well-known story. And see, religion will teach you to fear judgment for our sins and mistakes. But I don't believe that's what Jesus teaches at all. And there's another well-known story in the Bible, in the New Testament, and it's the story when Peter denied Jesus three times. And we talk about this story quite often. And, you know, Jesus denied Peter publicly, and he went away and cried. But the thing about that story, and the thing that we need to realize, is that that's not the end of the story. The, The story does not end there with Peter feeling bad, feeling like he messed up, and going to cry. And that we need to actually look at the whole story, the whole process to see what God is telling us through this story and why it's in the Bible. So I'm just going to read the last part of when uh, Peter denied Jesus three times. It's in uh, Luke 22, 61. And just quickly here, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. You know, at most times we end there, you know, talking about the guilt, the condemnation. But see, we need to skip forward a little bit and actually go, Luke doesn't finish this story. We have to go to John and we see Jesus when he comes and actually addresses this issue with Peter. We bring the rest of the story. And Jesus finds Peter fishing with some other disciples. And if we go to John... We will find the rest of this, this encounter. In John 21, and we'll just read 6 to 8. So Jesus sees them fishing from the shore, and he says, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did this, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. Peter, as soon as he knows it's Jesus, jumps in the water and swims to get to Jesus as fast as possible. You know, leaving the others in the boat, leaving the net full of fish. It's, he abandons everything and swims to get to Jesus as fast as possible. You know, nothing else in his mind matters. Not the net, not the boat, not anybody else, but get to Jesus. And even if we look at uh, Peter, he ran to the tomb when he heard that the tomb was empty. Peter, every time since that encounter where he denied Jesus, was always get to Jesus as fast as possible. Now, I want you to pause for a second. You know, Peter's jumping in the water again. And think about back to if you're a teenager and, you know, you ask your dad to borrow the car for the evening. And he says no, then he goes to town. So you take the car anyway, and you go out and you completely total the car. So, you know, you got to go to the police station, fill this. And as you're waiting to go back home, your dad's walking in the police station to get the car and all that. And, you know, you make eye contact. And, you know, and what are you thinking there? So you go home. He's got to spend some time at the police station. And then as he's coming home, you're, you're sitting at home and, like, what's running through your head? What are you thinking? And then you see him pull into the yard, pull in, stops, gets out of his car. Now, I want you to think, what do you think your response would be? Would it be like Peter to run to him? See, I'm willing to bet most of us would be like the prodigal son and run to a distant land, right? (laughs) We don't ever run to condemnation. We don't ever run to judgment or run to a rebuke. You know, we don't want to run to punishment or run to people admit that we messed up. But here we see Peter more times than one with this run to Jesus, run to Jesus, get to Jesus as fast as possible. So what did Peter know that we don't know or that we don't understand about Jesus? What did he learn about Jesus and the love of a father from his time he spent with him? See, there must have been something he knew about Jesus and the love of a father that we don't know or we don't understand. He knew that when he met Jesus, there was no condemnation to be had, that there was no rebuke, no judgment. He ran to Jesus without fear, just with love. He ran to rebuke, but to a loving embrace. Then Jesus asked Peter, you know, the most interesting question. If you read on there, further on, and he asked Jesus, or, yeah, he asked Peter, do you love me? And he says, 
feed my sheep. And he goes to ask him this three more times altogether. And, you know, most of my life I've read this so many times and I've never really paid much attention to it. I just thought that's what it is. But I don't know, it was really sticking to me. So I just asked God, you know, what, what does this mean? What are you trying to say to us? Because, see, Jesus can read Peter's thoughts, right? He can read people's thoughts. So he knew that Peter loved him. So then why ask the question, right? And I felt like saying there's two things that we need to get from the point of asking those questions. But first, I want to think about what's going through Peter's mind since he denied Jesus, which is what I believe is going through his mind. So I believe he's fighting a battle in his mind. Peter, if we read, he was always one of the leaders of the 12. He was the one that walked on water. He drew his sword to help Jesus. He said, I will follow you and die myself. Always one up front. And he, he messed up. He denied Jesus. You know, we're supposed to confess Jesus publicly, not deny him. But and I believe that the devil used this to plant a seed of doubt, to plant a seed of condemnation in his mind. And that, that is a tactic he will use with each and every one of us, that when we sin, he will tell us, you are not worthy of your call. You're not worthy of the love of God. You are not in the love of God. See, I believe Peter is feeling that he lost his call, that he lost his worthiness to be a disciple, which is exactly why we find him fishing. We find him fishing instead of preaching, instead of spreading the gospel, as he was called to do. That he was questioning if he himself, if Peter actually loved Jesus. And the devil planted a lie that drove Peter from preaching him on a pulpit to a fishing boat. He went back to what he felt worthy of doing, and that was fishing. That was before Jesus came into his life and said, no longer a fisher of fish, but of men. And the first question... Or the first thing I felt God is telling me about this is, it's not really about what he said, but it's about what he didn't say. And he didn't say, Peter, you messed up. You know, Peter, are you sorry? Or you're going to do better next time, right, Peter? He didn't give him a sermon on standing firm in your faith and standing firm in trials. He didn't say a single negative word. He didn't even bring up the whole thing. He didn't bring it up once. Nothing negative or harsh. It was just loving. And the second thing is, if you read this chapter in the NASB version, it calls this the love motivation. And in the NIV, it calls this Jesus reinstates Peter, which is where we read it from. And each time Jesus asks Peter if he loves me, he says, feed my sheep. You know, Jesus, through love, is showing Peter that he still loves him, that Peter still loves Jesus, and that he's so worthy of the call. He's saying that you haven't lost the calling of God in life, you haven't lost God in your life, that you are still worthy of what I called you to do, which was to be a disciple, which was to be a leader in the church. Through love, Jesus brought Peter back to his calling. And then if we look at the rest of Peter's life, it was life full of boldness and strength and faith. He never backed down from his faith. That... You know, Peter was actually crucified for his faith, right? He, he never backed down, but it was through love. And I believe that if Jesus didn't show him love in this, Peter might have just kept on fishing. Right. That through the love Peter experienced, he went on to being called an incredible leader in the church. You know, the, one of the leaders of the early church. We don't lose our calling because we sin. We don't lose the love of God because we mess up. When we sin or mess up, we don't need to be afraid of coming to the Father. We don't need to fear that we've lost our calling or lost our favor with God. He loves us the same no matter what state we are in. That we can come to him with our problems, we can come to him with our mistakes, without fear of condemnation. He's not there waiting to strike us with lightning or punishment, but rather with love and show us that he loves us always and every day. Don't fear running to Jesus, no matter what you did or what you say, that, you know, if we think denying Jesus would be pretty high up on the whole sin pyramid of thing. But Jesus doesn't even bring it up afterwards. To God, all sins are the same, and he's waiting with arms full of love and full of mercy. And then there's one more aspect of a father's love that I want to talk about. And it's not always as fun or as exciting to talk about, but it's also a very important part of a father's love. And that is guidance, discipline. The concept that the Bible talks about living and striving to live a holy and righteous life. And I believe that when we as a church, as a body of believers, when we pursue a life of holiness and righteousness, that we'll see new move and power of God in our lives that we've never seen before. 
that living a light, righteous life as a body of believers is the key to unlock more of miracles, signs, wonders, and just incredible new power and move of God. And I believe if you look at the early church, you know, Peter, Paul, the disciples, the reason the early church and the disciples did so many of the signs, wonders, and just this incredible in spreading the gospel was their devotion to living a holy and righteous life. You know, it was something that they, they talked a lot about, especially Paul. So, you know, we know that God wants us to live a holy and righteous life, and it's important. So the question becomes, how do we, right? How do we live a holy and righteous life? And this is the big difference between relationship and religion. See, a religious mindset will tell you, follow the Ten Commandments. You know, more of a do this and don't do this. A list of can and can'ts. But Jesus actually addresses this. They ask him, what is the greatest commandment? And he says in Matthew... Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, they're looking for which of the Ten Commandments is the greatest to follow. But Jesus is telling them that if we focus first on seeking God and growing in relationship and intimacy with Him, then the other commandments will follow. You know, if I look at my relationship with my wife, Jasmine, who just led worship, this, what drives me to become a better and better husband? What drives me to be faithful to her? What drives me to wake up in the morning and be a better and better husband, a better and better man for her? It's not because of any legalistic thing, because we're married, or what could happen if I don't. It's because of the love and relationship that we share, that I want to do everything I can to grow the love and grow the relationship and intimacy with her. Right? I don't want to be just her husband, I want to be her best friend. And I want to make sure I do nothing to come in between that relationship. See, Jesus never said the other commandments are void, They're not, we don't have to follow them. In fact, the Bible says that we are to follow all the commands of the Lord. But what he's saying is if we pursue the, lo- the Lord, if we pursue relationship, intimacy with him, his love, and the love will convict Just like the marriage, it's the love that makes me want to become a better man for her. It changes it from a have to to a want to. You know, and then we read verse 40, just after that, it says, All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And I believe what this is saying is that in the old covenant, before Jesus came, it was you had to follow these rules, these lists, the law, to get close to God. That if you want to go closer to God, you had to be better at following the law. But Jesus came and flipped the whole world upside down, bringing in the new covenant, where now it's we grow close to Jesus, we grow close to God, and the law will follow. To seek first his relationship and his love, and then righteousness will follow. That to fill the law now is done through the blood of Christ, through the cross, bringing love and relationship. By growing closer to God, we fulfill the law, and that is how we live a righteous life, by growing closer to God. This is the very reason why they, actually, they killed Jesus, because he taught relationship instead of the law. The Pharisees taught the old covenant. They taught that we need to follow the law to grow close to God. They just follow the law, do better at following these lists of rules. But Jesus says, my blood is enough, follow me. The way to righteousness is through love and relationship. So really, the real key to a new move and power of God is through loving relationship, which brings righteousness. And then when we try to go closer to God through the law, it'll just make us feel like failures, feel like we can't meet the mark. Because the reality of the world that we live in, a reality full of, a world full of sin and a broken world, is that we all make mistakes and we will never measure up to that standard. That we will measure up to the law, we will never make that perfect standard. But through the blood of Christ, through the cross, Jesus raising from the dead, defeating sin, we are made enough. Jesus doesn't want us to come to him perfect, just to come to him, and he will make us clean. He makes us perfect. And, you know, I'm not saying that because of how great the Father's love is, we can do whatever we want and get away with it. But I'm saying that if we focus on growing closer to God, the other things will follow. That knowing God and growing in relationship with him will guide us to want to change our lives to match his. Changes it from a have to to a want to. 
that once we experience the love of God, experience the true love of God, we will want to make sure we do nothing to become in between that relationship. We will want it to grow closer and deeper every day. You know, religion will teach you to deal with the sins before we come to God. You know, get rid of our addictions, our lusts, our sins, whatever the sin will be, that we need to get rid of that and gone before we can grow close to God. But see, these things, they're just symptoms of a bigger problem in our life. And that symptom is the presence of God, lack of relationship in our life. And that if we focus on fixing the problem, you know, not saying don't focus on or try to become better, but if you are struggling with an addiction and you just focus on the addiction, you can defeat it, but it'll just be replaced by another addiction unless it's replaced with the love of God. With his loving relationship, it'll just be... It'll be overcome, sorry. And his love will remove all the symptoms by treating the underlying condition, a lack of relationship. Religion, it will teach you to fear God and to follow him out of fear of going to hell, or that we need to fear him when we sin and mess up, you know, that we need to fear his punishment, fear his judgment, and that, you know, judgment day is coming, the whole repent or perish type of message. But Jesus, or God did not send his son to the earth, Jesus, to die on the cross just to create a fear-based, fear-based relationship. You know, if you go back to Genesis, it talks about God walked with Adam. They walked, you know, in friendship. And they had a perfect relationship. Then sin came into the world and put a barrier in between that relationship. And the whole point of the Bible, the whole point of sending Jesus to the earth to defeat sin, everything God did in there was to get back to that perfect relationship. And that's why I believe it's more important to preach the love of God than the wrath of God, because God is more loving. That the whole point was to bring us back into relationship. He did not send us his son to earth to die so that we can be afraid of him and follow him out of fear. I mean, that's not good enough. And I believe he wants a true loving relationship. We all choose to be with him and in him every single day. And, you know, the fact that we get to escape hell is just a bonus, just a byproduct of that, pro- that relationship. And when we enter into perfect love, we can experience heaven on earth today and walk in that perfect relationship with God and man. See, if you have a relationship based on fear, that's based on fear of going to hell, your relationship will only go deep enough to satisfy the fear. But a relationship based on and in love will continue to grow deeper and deeper each and every day. You know, God's original design for the world was not out of fear, out of judgment, but out of relationship and love. And, you know, the mistake I think we make is that we view the cross, Jesus dying on the cross, was all about heaven and hell. But really, I think that's a small portion of what the whole point of it was. And the point of it was to bring us back into relationship with God. So that we can walk again with God, just like Adam did. That was the point of the cross, so we can walk again with him on earth today. And we tend to focus on just the heaven and hell part, but I believe that's just a small portion of what it really was. You know, um, if we go back to the story of the prodigal son, we didn't read the whole thing, but in the story there's, um, there's a warning in it that I believe that we need to be taking very seriously. But the warning is not for the lost or the ones that haven't come home. And it actually is a talking about the other brother. You know, we didn't really read about him, but the other brother represents the church, represents the body of believers there. And if you were to read the rest of the story, he gets jealous when his brother comes home and sees that he gets the same reward. He gets resentment of his brother. You know, and I believe that he missed an incredible opportunity that he should have been watching and waiting with his father, that he should have ran with his father to bring his brother home. That... As a church, as a body of believers, we need to be watching and waiting with Jesus, with God, and looking for brothers and sisters who are turning, and that we are running out to meet them and help them home. You know, the Bible talks about co-laboring with God, that, and that's what that means. We go work with him to bring the lost sons and daughters home. See, when the lost brother came home, he would have felt his love of his father fully and completely. But he also would have felt his brother's jealousy. He would have felt his brother's resentment. And that would have made him feel uncomfortable and not fully accepted back home, right? He would have felt, every time he saw his brother, he would have felt that resentment. And that we need to make sure that when a lost brother or daughter comes back home, they come into our church, come into our home, 
And regardless of the stink, regardless of the mess that they bring, that they feel fully accepted home by us as well. That they feel our love of God. That they feel our love as long as God's the Father. That we can make them feel fully and completely accepted home as well. It'll make, how much easier would it have been for the other son, the lost one, to come home if, he would have, if his brother would have came and ran to him and helped him home alongside the father? You know, that we need to rejoice alongside the father, that we throw the party with the father when they come home, not get jealous that they say or share in the same reward as us. In, a, in Ephesians, Paul says... May, have, may you have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know that his love surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. You know, Paul, I believe, understood a lot more about the love of God than a lot of people did. You know, it was love that changed a man that was bent on destroying the church, that was bent on wrecking and bringing down the church. You know, he was persecuting and stoning members of the church. But it was love that turned him to arguably one of the most influential Christians in the history of the world. That without him, the world and Christianity would look completely different than it does today. It was the love of God that changed him completely. And you know... If you have a hard time understanding or viewing the love of God, a father's love as a good thing, for whatever reason, be be past experiences or, you know, things you've been taught or told, I just want you to know that no matter what you do, no matter where you go, no matter what you believe or what you say, you cannot outrun the love of God. That you can't out the love of God. That the love of a father is always pursuing and waiting for us no matter what we go. Simply God wants a loving relationship to walk with us again. And then nothing will ever change the way God loves you. You know, we were slaves to sin. We were under sin. But we become friends of God. So that's pretty much all I have for you guys today. So I just, I want to thank you so much for listening to me today. And, um... Uh, after I pray, you're, you're free to go, but uh, if anybody wants prayer for absolutely anything, whether it be to experience the love of God or uh, healing or absolutely anything like that, me and my wife Jasmine will just stay up here for as long as anybody wants, and we absolutely love praying for people and praying over people. So yeah, I'm just going to pray, and I just want to thank you so much for listening to me today. Lord, thank you so much for today, and just want to thank you so much for your love. Just thank you so much for your love, how it's always pursuing, always chasing us down. And I just pray now you'll go with us this week, God, that you will just, each and everybody here will just experience your love in a new and powerful way. We just thank you so much for your love, and I just pray you go with us ahead of us this week. Amen.